Thank you for listening to me, letting me ramble on for about 30 minutes about my favorite topic, podcasting. Um, so first of all, what gives me the right to stand up here and tell you about podcasting? Uh, Mark told you a little bit about my background. I'm chief commercial officer at ACAST. ACAST is a company that was based in Stockholm. Uh, it started about uh, April 2014. And a bunch of really smart folks wanted to figure out how to fix everything that was broken in the podcast ecosystem. Uh, they then rolled out in the UK in the fall of that year, and uh, I started the business in the US right before uh, Christmas of this year. Before ACAST, uh, as Mark mentioned, I uh, was in charge of sponsorship at WNYC. They are one of the biggest uh, producers of amazing podcast content. I'm incredibly proud to have been a part of their history. I was the first digital sales hire there and realized, oh gosh, we have all this inventory on a monthly basis that we're just leaving on the table. How do we get the dollars to all of those impressions? Well, we have to build some ad tech. We have to build an ad operations ecosystem. So I worked really hard with the folks there and some vendor friends to figure out how to do dynamic ad insertion at WNYC, and I brought that knowledge to what I'm doing today at ACAST. Another thing that I'm involved in is I was a founding uh, member of the IAB's podcast working group. So what this is, is a group of folks that all have skin in the podcast game, get together on a regular basis and like duke it out <laughs> about our issues. But the real sort of thrust of sort of what we're doing here is trying to, as an industry, make it easier for advertisers to buy podcasts. What do we need to do? And you know, needless to say, metrics are a big part of this conversation. So I'll bring you up to speed on what those conversations are as well. So let's start the discussion with you know, before we get into the future of podcasting, let's take a peek at the podcast space today, right? There's a very complicated ecosystem filled with all kinds of players. And the one thing I think we can all agree on is that there's a lot of activity and bubbling and growth happening. The thing to know is that podcasting is mainstream in the US today. It is mainstream. So our good friends at Edison, along with the help from Triton, uh, came out with their uh, infinite dial study this year and showed us that on a monthly basis, we have about 57 million people listening to podcasts in the US that are 12 plus. On a weekly basis, it's 35 million. How do you compare that to anything? What does that mean in the scope of media? Well, Game of Thrones uh, season finale had about 8 million listeners or watchers, sorry, viewers. Uh, and the Super Bowl this past year had about 114 million. So it's not an insignificant group of folks that are listening to podcasts on a regular basis in the US. This is big enough to get advertisers' attention and have a conversation about how to reach them. So what is the podcast ecosystem? It is very complicated. There are companies that represent individual slices of this ecosystem and also companies that represent multiple slices of this ecosystem. But to understand how complicated it is, you really need to know sort of all the points of entry that an organization can get into this ecosystem. So if you start with a content producer, this is pretty straightforward. Gimlet, for example, is a content producer. This is someone that makes great content and puts it out there into the world. The entire podcast ecosystem relies on the creation of content, because that's the bread and butter of what it is. Then you have hosting platforms, and you can also pair this with distribution platforms. This is where those content creators host their audio. It's the servers that the audio lives on and how it gets out into the world, right? That's a very important piece of this ecosystem because it, the data travels with this piece of the pie. Then you have the CMS. This is an interface that the producers use to edit their shows, to inject ad markers so that ads can be injected into their shows, and to get their RSS feeds out to all the multiple places where people will be listening to their shows. And RSS feeds, sorry if I'm talking too much geek, but it's, it's basically the method that you get the audio file to all the various players where people will hear it. We talked about distribution, ad tech. Ad tech is probably the most misunderstood part of this ecosystem because everybody sells ads in podcasts, but do they, really, do they really use ad tech to get their ads into the podcast? Ad tech is software that allows uh, an operations person or an ad operations person to tell the, ad, the software where to put the ad and for how long to keep it running and under what conditions it should serve. It's not simply putting a peg in a hole 
It's very complicated, and there are a number of algorithms that go into determining what ads should go into what podcasts and when. So this is a more complicated piece of the ecosystem than most believe. Then we have content networks. So this could be a couple of things. This could be a tech network. This could also just be a collection of shows that are produced or owned by one entity, right? So the content network could be um, Podcast One. They have a network, and they sell ads on it, and it is their network, and you know that because of all the branding that's associated with the shows on their network. You also have something like Acast, where they're not necessarily our shows, but they're in an ecosystem where we can place an ad across any of them within the context of one ad campaign, and it would just run automatically throughout the network. So there are a couple of ways of thinking about networks in the context of podcasts. Then you have apps, players. How do people listen, right? This is the podcast app. This is Stitcher. This is Acast is in this space, too. There are no, this is the place that the RSS feed goes to where the user interacts and pushes play to get the content. And then finally, you have the sales rep. You have entities like Midroll, who are out there talking to advertisers on behalf of a variety of shows, and they don't necessarily own or produce or host those shows, but they are the entity that goes out and sells them. So that's the ecosystem. And there are so many companies that are entering at all these different points, and again, many of them at multiple points, but just to sort of lay it all out and see how complicated it is, I think is a useful exercise. So because there's so much activity in this space, we're starting to see some of the biggies come in. Why? You know, there's a lot of activity with sort of lots of fun new startups happening, but when podcasting is mainstream and you see big brands like these entering into the space, you know that there's some heat there. And that's a good thing, I think. Also, on the content side, we're seeing the biggies come in, right? So if you've ever attended um, a fun event like uh, podcast, uh, what's the one in, that was in uh, Texas last year? Podcast. Boom. So podcast movement was so eye-opening to me because I lived in a world of radio labs and Freakonomics and BuzzFeed. And when I went there and saw all the passionate people who are just making podcasts in their closets at home and really just have a following of maybe 10 people, but those 10 people really love the show, it totally opened my eyes to how much you know, passion is in the space. And you know, as much as the consumption is happening with you know, the 80-20 rule, 20% 20 of the shows are generating 80% of the, the impressions, these guys want to be that 20%. So it's a very interesting time when, when brands like these are starting to take podcasts seriously. Another thing to note, and this is particularly um, ACAST's point of view, is that we're seeing a diversification of content coming into the space. Uh, I believe Edison's research showed that from, from 2013 to this year, women's listening doubled in podcasting. And why is that? because you're seeing more diverse voices coming into the space. You're seeing people of color, you're seeing women, you're seeing the LGBT community. And that's great, because guess what? They're bringing their tribes along with them. They're expanding the pie because people are coming to hear these diverse voices in the space. And this is a good thing. So what about the ad ecosystem? We took a look at the podcast ecosystem, but when you th there's a very complicated conversation to be had about what exactly is being sold when we talk to these advertisers about this space, right? And various companies have various approaches, and some have multiple approaches. But to really understand what these are, I thought it would be helpful to break it down. Sound good? OK. So the first approach that I can outline here is called baked in. Baked in is what happens when uh, let's say Midroll, for example, has a show that they're representing, and they know that the host's red spots are so very effective, they just give the host some copy, and the host will integrate it into the show itself, and it'll become a part of the show. We call that baked in. It doesn't come out, it stays in, it goes for the life of the campaign and even longer, and advertisers find a whole lot of value in that. Sorry, I'm like adjusting my mic here. Produced ads. Produced ads can be baked in, but they tend to be um, a little more thought out and a little more, there's a little more sort of high touch to them. Think of Gimlet. If anyone has listened to an ad, a wonderful ad made by those guys, they take care to create produced ads so that 
the quality of the ad is as close to the quality of the content as possible. Again, those could be either baked in or inserted. Then we have custom content. I think we would all agree that the leader in this space is the Panoply Group. Uh, they do amazing work with brands to come up with audio content that can stand on its own as content on behalf of the brand, that sort of integrates the brand's objective and the brand's voice. And that can live on its own as a podcast. It could be attached to a podcast in some way. The means by which it's distributed is up in the air. There's a number of ways you can do it. And then we have ad insertion. Ad insertion can sometimes be seen in a negative way. Every once in a while, I'll see like a look in someone's eye when I say we do ad insertion because they associate it with dirty radio ads. And I'm sorry for the people in the room that are on the traditional side. Um, the thing to know about ad insertion is that it doesn't necessarily mean that you're taking network radio creative and you're putting it on podcasts. It doesn't mean that. All it is is a mechanism to get an audio file that contains an ad into a podcast and to apply all of the variables possible in the algorithm in your ad tech, meaning start date, end date, you can geo-target, you can send it only to people who have iPhones, you know, all kinds of different things, and, it, and you can track it. That's the main thing. That's the most important thing about ad insertion. So this is the ecosystem, and in many cases, they overlap. You can have a produced ad that's inserted, you can have custom content that's baked in, and all kinds of variations on the, on the four here. One thing to note, though, and this is kind of my pet peeve, is when we're talking about pricing these different ad products, it's really important that we're all on the same page about the duration of time in which we're counting, right? So a CPM is simply, you know, a rate for a number of impressions given, and it's very clean cut. You're getting this many impressions, you're paying this much, this is how much your campaign costs. When it comes to applying a CPM to a baked-in ad, the duration of the time that you're counting is extremely important in order for there to be apples to apples comparison among campaigns, right? So let's say, for example, you're an advertiser and you have $10,000 to spend on a podcast campaign. And this particular podcast delivers 100,000 downloads a week. If you say, hey, I'm gonna give you a week in my podcast, 100% share of voice, it's gonna cost you 10 grand, that's $100 CPM because you're only counting a week. If you say, hey, you're gonna be on for a month, you're gonna get every impression, it's gonna cost you $10,000, now you're talking a $25 CPM, because you're counting for four weeks worth of M's, as opposed to just one. At nine weeks, it plummets to $11, and at six months, it plummets to four. So when you're talking about baked in ads, you can apply a CPM to them, but know that in the current state of affairs, Podcast A is not necessarily counting for the same duration as Podcast B, so that CPM can be a little suspect unless you nail down how long you're counting. And that I'm actually working within the IAB to sort of come up with a standard of time interval so that we don't have to have any confusion on this and it helps the advertisers know what they're getting for their dollars. So what are some other ways that you can generate revenue with podcasts, right? Um, we've seen a flurry of diversification strategies like paywalls, subscriptions. These are really fun. Howl is one. You can get a subscription and get back catalog of your favorite uh, episodes there. Um, Slate Plus is another approach. You can get like bonus extra content if you, if you sign up. And then you have the other side, which is um, the Kickstarter, Patreon, public radio side, where the giving is just out of the goodness of your heart. You don't necessarily have to get anything specific in return. Um, quick story, Radiolab was probably one of the most profitable podcasts we had when I was at WNYC, and it took the sales team the better part of a year to generate about $3 million from the ad inventory, and that was not 100% sellout by any means. But when it would come to pledge time, and we would put one very basic ask in the podcast for seven days, just Put it in for seven days, take it out. $200,000 instantly. Just from people who cared, loved them, wanted to make sure that they could live to see another day. That is not a cheap show to produce, by the way, so this is not extravagant uh, ratios. Um, but you can see how having a diversified revenue stream makes sense in that case. 
So you should know that in the revenue ecosystem of podcasting, this is happening. And the interesting thing is that in some cases, it is, uh, it is affecting the number of episodes that go out uh, without ads in them or with ads in them. It could affect ad inventory in terms of, oh, if everybody sort of shifts over to this side where they're taking this, you know, other approach to revenue, what does that mean for the number of impressions that will be available in the ad-supported side? Or you can come up with strategies that don't take away inventory from the ad-supported side and just generate additional content in order to please your audience in this way. So a lot of experimentation is happening here, and I think there's actually a lot of opportunity um, for entrepreneurs if they want to uh, look into that. So, we looked at the podcast ecosystem. We see that it's huge. There's tons of people coming in at all different points in the ecosystem. We saw the ad side of the space. We saw all the different ways that you can buy ads, the different kinds of ads, the different combinations of getting the ads into the podcast. How much money is really being spent in this space? Like, there's all this activity. The big guys are coming in. New York Times, was it, pu published an article, or was it the Wall Street Journal that said this, this industry was worth 36 million? Bullshit. No, no. I know my budgets, I know the budgets of the places I've been before, I know the budgets of many of my competitors, and just through a handful of folks, it far exceeded 36 million. We're, we're probably looking in the 85 to 100 last year. This year, it's on fire. If the growth in the last year of just listening is 25%, you can imagine what the growth in revenue is. And now that we have all these new ways of coming at the ad side, with the custom content, with the produced content, with dynamic ad insertion, which is opening up all kinds of impressions, this space is going to explode. So let's talk a little bit about the buying side. Who is actually buying the podcast? What part of the agencies? What part of the, you know, who are the marketers that are going after these, these that are spending these dollars? So for the most part, at the major agencies, you have a mix. You have folks that used to spend those dollars on radio. That's real. They're now shifting them over to the podcast side. You also have folks who are on the digital side and are trying to make this work on the digital side. And I would argue that it's still a little quasi-digital when it comes to how you can completely close the loop on tracking. We're seeing, in my universe, the best possible buyer is the CEO of a company that listens to podcasts and calls you up and says, I've got to be on this show. I love it so much, because they get it. And this happens all the time, by the way. This is how MailChimp started. This is how Squarespace started. This is how a company called Betterment started that spends hundreds of thousands of dollars in the podcast space because they themselves were engaged podcast listeners and knew instinctively that this would work for their brand. Then, of course, you have um, you know, the folks that are uh, sort of in the space representing podcasts in various forms, but for the most part, the ad agencies are trying to figure out which bucket to pull the dollars from to do this, right? And in many cases, they're in testing mode. We're seeing a lot of this, oh, but I have an innovation budget that I can pull this from to see if it's worth taking the risk. You'll see a lot of direct response advertisers. We've talked about this a little bit uh, throughout the last couple of days. Direct response advertisers love this space because even though they can't measure the way they could measure, let's say, display, this audience is so engaged that when you have the combination of a super engaged audience, a host that reads a spot, and an audience that's just willing to listen and believe because there's so much credibility built up there, you're gonna see acquisition, you're gonna see activity, and they have, and they've come back again and again and again. That's not to say that the brand advertisers aren't in this space, and actually Andy talked about bringing more brand advertisers into the space with custom content. Great, they're noticing it. Shows like Freakonomics broke Goldman Sachs, uh, GE, uh, Morgan Stanley, into the podcast space. These are blue chip brands that recognize that these are smart, engaged people that are listening to podcasts, and this is the only way you're going to reach them if you're Goldman Sachs. So it's a very quickly evolving ecosystem on the buying side. So who are these people that everyone's clamoring to get at? Like, what do we know about them? What does the data show? How do we get at them? For the most part, the data that we've got about podcast listening is coming from surveys, listener surveys. 
because it's very hard, as we'll talk about in a minute, to connect an individual digitally to the rest of their digital life through podcasts. We know that they're avid consumers. The Edison research shows them 42% of all podcast listeners consume four to 11 podcasts a week. If you consider many of those are an hour long, that's a huge commitment to the platform. So what do we know? What can we know? We, we have a, a deviation in knowledge and the potential to know. On the one side, it is from the creators and the senders out, the distributors of the content. We know, because we host them on our servers, how many times it went out, how many requests there were, where did those requests come from. You know, we can sort of cluster that data around what we sent out into the universe. What we don't know, because we don't own the entire ecosystem, is what happened once the RSS feed got to its final destination. That's where the player knowledge comes in. So if you're a player, you know, okay, within my environment, maybe somebody signed in with Facebook, so I know their gender, their age roughly, their interests. I know what they listen to in my player, what else they listen to in my player. Most importantly, how long they listened, when they stopped, if they heard the ad. Because at the end of the day, that's where it's at, right? Right now, because these two separate universes don't have a closed loop of information, um, many of them do. Many of them do offer this information to podcasters, so I have to give props to Stitcher. Open platform, they're like happy to show you everything about when listening's happening, they're great. iTunes, not so much. <laughs> so unfortunately, the majority of listening happens within the podcast app in iPhones, 70 plus percent I think is the latest uh, stat. So the kind of data that you can get, you can extrapolate, but when you're extrapolating from a minority percentage, there's some danger there in the, in the validity of your data. So let's talk about the future. What, what does ACAST think about the future of podcasting? Where are we putting our money, knowing what we know about the podcast environment, knowing what we know about the ad ecosystem, the buyers and the users? What is it that we're looking forward to? What are we banking on? What are we putting our bets on? <laughs> my, my German uh, biz dev partner in Sweden put this image in. If any of you know, this is uh, Queen. We're breaking free. We've got to break free of the app. This is the number one priority for us, right? So what this means is, if all of the listening, if everyone in this space is sort of elbowing around these people that are listening within these apps environments, they're just going to be trading out listening for, with, across each other. How do you expand the pie? How do you get people that aren't already in these walled gardens of apps? You go out. You take an embeddable player, you take, a, you take a, a shareable player, and you tweet out a moment of audio into an environment where people are, and they like you, and they're willing to engage with you, but they're not necessarily podcast listeners, right? Like, think about the hurdles that were involved in getting someone on Twitter to listen to a podcast. You would send out a link, you'd have to go get the app, you'd have to download the, you'd have to get a subscription, you'd have to, there's like 29 steps, it's insane. But if you can break that barrier down and just say, listen, right now, to this moment of this podcast, this is where Hillary Clinton chokes on her gum when the ladies from another round ask her a really tough question, go. It's really effective, and you're getting new people into the space. So this is what we're banking on. Also, giving podcasters control over diversifying their revenue streams. Right? So you have a lot of podcasters that are putting all their eggs in one basket. They're trusting folks to sell their ads for them and hoping that they get enough money so that it'll keep them going. But um, ACAST developed this, this system. We launched something called ACAST Plus. And again, I'm sorry that I'm not sh like shilling ACAST, but the whole idea here is that instead of restricting access to the episodes that the users want on a regular basis, we give the podcast producers the control to produce something else, something new, maybe once, maybe every week, however they want to do it. If they want to diversify their revenue stream and ask a user to just for this one episode, just a couple bucks, if you want it, it's fun, it's cool, I made it for you, if you want it, it's a couple bucks. If not, just listen to my regular episodes, it's totally cool. We saw the adoption of this, we released it about a week ago, a week and a half ago, and there's a football uh, podcast in the UK called The Football Ramble, Within hours, 3,000 people had subscribed to this one bonus episode that they put out. Hours. 
It's because they weren't committing to a long-term thing, they thought it was a really cool thing that they were getting, and the football ramble like, just netted that revenue. That's cool, but it was completely within their control. And every individual show can decide what's right for them in terms of the amount of content they put out, if they put out anything. It, it just gives them the control to play in that space. And we feel like that's gonna keep them happy, and that's gonna keep users engaged. We also see a future where audio can be coupled with other things in this space, where you can create 360-degree views, 360-degree mobile experiences for brands in particular in this space. So we've already started experimenting with this approach with our player, and we have a patent on this in the US. But the idea behind this is, what if you could punctuate the audio with visuals, videos, clickable links, e-commerce. It works to enhance storytelling. So for example, remember when you were listening to Serial for the first time, and what if they said, oh, and if you want to look, you can see the map where the body was found right now in the player. You'd be like, oh gosh, okay, where is that? Or you'd do it after your bike ride, or after your, your run, you would go back and see it. In this case, what ACAS is doing is working directly with advertisers, and we're saying, hey, there's this retailer in the UK, ASOS, and they're the fashion brand. And what they did was they wanted to, as many brands do, have a custom uh, podcast. We're like, okay, that's cool, but what if we took it a little further? Instead of just having a podcast, and in this case, it's a pretty cool podcast called My Big Idea that features young women entrepreneurs in the fashion space. What if you allowed those young women to put up images of their fashion line? pictures of their process in this journey. Like, this is where I sourced the materials. This is my trip to Paris to like, learn from the best. And as you're following their story, you're able to buy that shirt that she's designed in ASOS through this player. They love the idea. And they're just baby stepping. This is just a germ of an idea that brands can really take and run with if they want to. So that's where we see the future going. And also, creative, and I'm so glad that we started the whole, the whole uh, conference with a conversation about creative, because this is my crusade this year. Last year it was convincing people that dynamic ad insertion was a thing. I think we all agree it is. This year it's about, we deserve creative that is made for podcasts. And I know that the creative community is into it. I've talked to a couple of them who are into it. It was nice to hear Pandora, like, fooling around with different ages of voices and trying to figure out how to really super serve their listeners, that is so heartening to me. But this is the year that we are no longer gonna be lazy about just saying, ah, radio creative, we'll just put in a podcast, it'll be fine. No, <laughs> you are literally inside somebody's head. You do not shout at them when you're inside their head. We deserve better. And I think that this is the year that we're gonna start seeing creative people pushing the envelope a little bit and getting a little data under their belts so that they can give the best ad experience they possibly can. So the takeaways. Thank you for being so patient and letting me ramble on about my favorite topic. <laughs> if I was gonna leave you with anything, I would say these three things. The future is about getting out of the apps, thinking in new ways about how we can get audio in the ears of people who aren't necessarily already podcast listeners. It's about having diverse voices grow the whole space for us, bringing women, bringing people of color, bringing the LGBT community into the space. It's working. 2013, you had very few female-hosted podcasts. Now you have tons. What happened? The audience doubled. It works. Also, audio creative has to get better. We deserve it. If you have any questions, I am here and happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, you can hit me up at, at SarahVM on Twitter or Sarah at ACAST.com. <laughs>